This is not a sponsored video, so I don't have any conflicts of interest here. Hi, I'm Dr. Roger Sohn. I'm a board certified orthopedic surgeon and I specialize in the shoulder and arm. I've been treating a lot of patients lately who have rotator cuff problems. Now, you've probably heard of a rotator cuff tear and you've probably heard of the rotator cuff, but if you haven't, the rotator cuff is a set of muscles that's underneath the big show muscles of the shoulder. So under the deltoid, if you looked, you would see four muscles and their names are the supraspase, that's the top muscle, the most important one that we will be talking about, but there's also the infraspase, the subscapularis, and the teres minor. So we see by far the most problems in the supraspinatus tendon. The supraspinatus is the prime mover when you go to elevate your shoulder, especially to the side. So that first maybe 60 degrees of elevation, that's the initiation of elevation, that's started by the supraspinatus tendon. So a lot of times folks will have problems with the supraspinatus tendon and they will describe it as pain when they go through that motion. They call it a painful arc as their arm comes up and starts the motion, especially if you're carrying something with weight and you go to lift your arms before the deltoid can really take over, that can cause pain in the lateral shoulder. Pa patients will describe it as pain here on the outside of the shoulder. Now one of the more obvious injuries to the rotator cuff could be a full thickness rotator cuff tear. You can see here that there's uh, the intact rotator cuff looks kind of like this and if you can see there's a, a picture of a damaged rotator cuff, you can see a hole in the rotator cuff tendon and specifically the supraspinatus tendon. Now although some patients will have this type of an appearance to their rotator cuff, the vast majority don't. In fact, most people who come to me with rotator cuff pain will have what's called impingement syndrome or they'll have tendonitis of the tendon. Some people will also call it tendinosis, which is partial damage to some of the fibers on the inside of the, of the tendon. And then, of course, there are some fun acronyms. One's called the PASTA lesion or partial articular sided supraspinatus tendon avulsion. And then there is the PABS or partial bursal sided tear. And these are both injuries to the rotator cuff, but they don't actually go fully through the tendon. So a lot of times you'll have maybe a 30% or a 50%, or you can have any percentage tear before it becomes a full thickness tear. But a lot of folks will be walking around using their arm quite normally, but they have pain because although the tendon still does its job, a lot of times it has pain, they have pain because not as many of the fibers are connected to the, to the bone as they should be. So a lot of folks who have a full thickness rotator cuff tear, it's it's easier to make a recommendation for surgery because you can clearly see that the tendon is disconnected and we want to reconnect it to the bone and so we have anchors and, and tools to do that arthroscopically. In the case of the partial thickness rotator cuff uh, tear or even just partial fraying of the tendon, it's not quite so straightforward. And in fact, a lot of times the tendon can look like this where it's not clearly torn. You can see that the surface looks a bit frayed and it's not a happy looking tendon, not a healthy looking tendon. In those cases, we didn't used to have a great option. We used to tell folks, well, um, we can do a lot of physical therapy, maybe we can put some cortisone here and try to decrease the pain. And in fact, there was a popular surgery that used to be done frequently called a subacromial decompression. Now, a subacromial decompression was simply an operation where we would put a camera inside the shoulder and look for some irregularities on the roof or the acromion of the shoulder, and we'd use instruments to smooth down the roof or create a little bit of extra space. In some cases, the culprit would have been the AC joint where there'd have been a bone spur hanging down. And by smoothing down the surface, at least the, the theory goes that we would have more room for the rotator cuff and less, um, less of a tendency to impinge or rub against those sorts of impinging structures as the shoulder would be raised. The results haven't been all that fantastic. And in fact, in one of my blog posts, I talk about a paper showing that subacromial decompression when compared to doing a sham operation where essentially they put a camera inside and then removed the camera after not doing anything, they found no difference in the final outcome. So essentially a subacromial decompression was not really a great way to treat these. Another way that partial tears can be treated is to do what's called a completion and full repair. So like it sounds, you would actually place your camera inside, you would identify the location of the partial tear, and then you would complete the tear using either a scalpel or some sort of cutting device to give you access to the inside from the outside. But in fact, it actually is quite accepted as one of the treatments for a partial thickness rotator cuff tear, especially that pasta lesion we discussed. Um, and so then you place an anchor in and then the idea or the actual uh, theory and practice of this is that the tendon will then be reattached and then fully heal because of the stimulation and all the um, healing milieu that happens after placing uh, the anchors in the bone and so forth. But one of the things about doing that surgery, it never really felt good to do this because we all know that in a certain percentage of patients where you repair a tendon, it actually won't heal because of lack of blood supply and various other things. So in the cases where I did that surgery, I always felt a little bit concerned that was I creating a bigger problem if this patient doesn't go on to heal this. So fast forward 
to the present time, about six years ago, I started hearing about this product called the Regenitin Patch. And in fact, it was interesting to hear about this at the shoulder meetings and mostly it'd be academic guys talking about it. And it was nice to hear that they were having good results with this, but I couldn't use it because um, in the regular world, insurance companies wouldn't pay for it. So more recently, we have been able to use this patch and insurance companies have been more willing to reimburse surgery centers and hospitals for using this type of a patch. And this Regenitin patch is an interesting patch. It's bovine collagen, it's a collagen patch. It's a little bit bigger than two postage stamps put together. And you've probably heard of collagen being used in other places, for example, in the face for, as the fillers and, as in, and for treatment for wrinkles and such like that. So in the shoulder now we have this collagen patch, which is a cool device. Here's some video from the manufacturer's website showing how we actually can place it arthroscopically and we can unfurl it kind of like an umbrella and then we place it in place with some of these bioabsorbable staples and you can see over the course of time in this animation that the collagen patch becomes incorporated with the native tendon and thickens it. There are several studies to support this and you can see that some of these included retrieval studies where they actually went in and removed samples of the tissue in a biopsy and you can see here there's this is the histology you can see the initial patch is clearly discernible from the from the tendon beneath. And as we approach the three and six month mark, the patch becomes essentially indistinguishable from the native tendon, which is below. This study actually showed impressive results and it came from a very reputable journal, the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery. And it shows that the collagen patch was able to thicken the tendon by an average of two millimeters, which is, is quite significant. Now that we have this option available to us, I actually feel like it has really become a mainstay part of my practice. There are many patients where a traditional repair isn't called for. And again, like I've said, I don't like doing a, a full completion of the tear and then repairing that tear because of the risks that are involved with it. So having this option available has been really revolutionary in my practice because I feel like I can treat more patients and help those patients who previously would just get you know, uh, Band-Aid solutions such as cortisone injections or um, physical therapy or things that you know would give them partial relief but it wouldn't quite solve their problem. Of course, there are risks of a surgery like this, including that you could have an infection or that you could have a reaction to the collagen itself. There has been one study showing that patients get a bit stiffer after this type of a procedure. In my practice, the results have been very good. I have not had any complications such as an inflammatory response to the patch. Neither have we seen a whole lot of stiffness. Uh, to be quite honest, a lot of patients get stiff after doing a shoulder arthroscopy and a rotator cuff repair or any sort of procedure around the shoulder. So I have not noticed that anybody's getting more stiff than usual with this type of a product. So I've been very happy to use it. It's great to have as a product in our arsenal. Now since Smith & Nephew released this product, there have been several other similar products that have come to the market. One of them is called Tapestry, another one's called Cuffmen. These are competitive products that do a similar type of thing. I think it's great that we have several options out there now because sometimes it can be hard to get authorization from the insurance company to use some of these products. So more options is better. So for the first two weeks after a surgery like this, you need to wear a sling and keep the arm pretty quiet in the sling. You would start physical therapy, of course, and they'd be doing passive exercises with you. Passive means that you're not using your own power to raise the arm. So generally for six weeks, that restriction for passive motion only stays in place. So after six weeks, we let people start using their own power to raise the arm. If there are other things done at the same time, so for example, if we do a, a repair of another tendon, so for example, the subscapularis tendon, that can mean that we have to keep the restrictions in place for about the first 12 weeks. So that can add some time to the recovery. At least at the time of this filming, the cost of the patch is about $3,500. In every case where we do this surgery, we have to get authorization from the insurance company beforehand. So generally we have a good idea if there's going to be a portion that you have to pay for. Most of the time that is not the case. However, I've had some of my patients receive what's called an advanced billing notice from the surgery center or from the hospital saying that if the insurance company didn't pay for it, that they would be responsible for the full cost. So to sum things up, partial rotator cuff tears were previously a very difficult problem to treat. Thankfully now we have a lot of new options and specifically I like this collagen patch option because not only does it have a good track record, but also I've used it personally in my patients and I've been able to track results for over two years with great results. So that wraps up this video about partial thickness rotator cuff tears and the collagen patch options we have. If you have any questions about this or anything else related to the shoulder or if you have any suggestions for future topics, please put them in the comment section below and don't forget to like the video and subscribe. 
Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.